basically what we're going to talk about is how, what is the appropriations process, how does it work, who are the decision makers, um, some key terms, and an over, a true overview of how um, the money gets used once it gets to NIH and FDA. Um, and I'm from Research America. We're an organization, um, an umbrella organization, um, with members across patient advocacy organizations, industry, um, academic research institutions, um, scientific societies, all advocating for medical research. So when we're talking about the appropriations process, um, we have to take a step back and look at the federal budget, and I won't get too deep into the numbers, but that big um, blue section, about two-thirds of the federal budget, is just a mandatory funding so that you can also think of as automatic. Um, that's Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security payments. That is not what we're talking about. Those um, every day, every year are just happening. Congress is not touching them on a regular basis. So we're actually only looking at one-third of the federal budget, the red section, also known as discretionary funding. And that's what Congress every year takes a look at and decides how they want to allocate funding to all of the um, priorities when we think about education, defense, research is among them. All of those programs are within this one-third of the budget. And so you'll hear a little bit um, as we go along about um, different types of bills. And so just an overview, some terminology. Authorization bills, that's just what creates programs, um, sets up new federal agencies. Um, that's what allows them to exist. And then the appropriations process is what actually writes them a check so they can spend money and have money to, to dole out for their priorities. Um, and so there's a couple types of appropriations bills. You, um, off the bat, we're hoping to get for regular order, so that would be a reg regular appropriations bill. That means that Congress is taking a look this year and saying, okay, this year, what are our priorities and how are we going to dole out the money? If we miss the mark and they don't get to the deadline, um, having come to an agreement and signed a bill um, by the president, we would have to do a continuing resolution which means that we're going to take this year's funding that we're in and just continue spending at that level. So that would be flat funding. It means you're not getting an increase, you're probably not getting a decrease, but um, that's sort of a missed opportunity. So that is a reality that could happen this year, but of course we're working towards regular order and reallocating our priorities. Um, and supplemental, you don't have to worry about. That would be if there's like a hurricane and we're, we're giving money to that. So. Um, and so the way the appropriations process works is when you think about all of the discretionary priorities they are, we divide them into about 12 categories known as subcommittees. Um, and so the two main that we care about in this room, um, and for the purposes of this presentation, are just labor H. So you'll see that covers labor, all of the health and human services priorities, and the Department of Education and a few other related agencies. So that's where NIH funding is. And AG agriculture, um, rural development, and food and drug administration, and that's where the FDA funding is. And so when we think about who are the decision makers, um, there are leaders, and I'll show you who they are, but I also want you to keep in mind that every member of Congress gets to weigh in into the appropriations process. So you're here at a really critical time, and I'll show you the timeline in a minute, um, but every member that you're meeting with, even if they're not going to be on this slide, are a, is a person who's key in the appropriations process. So you just communicating what your priorities are to your members is very important. And the staff as well, because the staff are the ones that are working behind the scenes to make this happen. So just because you might not meet with someone on this slide doesn't mean they are not a key decision maker. But there is leadership in the appropriations committee. Um, so in the House and Senate, we have the full uh, committee leadership, so they're overseeing all of those 12 bills. Um, and then we have specific leadership for labor age with NIH and also specific leadership for ag, and they're the ones controlling FDA. So you may be meeting with some of these people. You might rep recognize them as being from your home state or district. Um, but please do keep in mind that just um, if, if your member is not on this slide, does not mean that your member is not important. And it's still important to communicate. And if you're talking to staff, you'll hear more about what makes a good congressional meeting, but um, staff are just as important as well. Okay, so here's where I throw a wrench into the process. Congress doesn't always work the way they're supposed to in a social studies textbook or, you know, Government 101 class. Um, so on the top, you know, in theory, um, if this were a normal year, but is it ever a normal year? I know Cheryl and Emily will talk to you about this is an election year, and so the timeline becomes a little bit different. Um, but so you can see where 
we sort of would be in the appropriations process normally. We'd be considering a, the president has, has sent his budget, so that was on time, um, and Congress would be working through setting up a budget blueprint. Um, but of course, because Congress is always you know, changing on the fly, Last year, there was a budget deal, an agreement, that actually set budget levels for this year, FY17, that we're advocating for now. So we're sort of skipping ahead to the part of the process where the appropriations committees are beginning to negotiate their bills, beginning to have funding levels set. And so you are here at an incredibly crucial time. Um, now is the time when members through the month of March are going to be working through appropriations levels, setting the numbers for NIH, FDA, and all the different priorities. Um, and I will say, this might be a little bit of, so we've sped through the process, we're doing now in March what we often do through the summertime, um, but it could be a little bit of a hurry up and wait situation. Um, we might, uh, you'll see as they talk about the election process, um, that that might sort of throw a wrench into finishing this timeline all the way through, because the new fiscal year is just about one month before election day. So there is a potential that, as I said, when we think back to the types of appropriations bills, we could have a continuing resolution, meaning we'll keep FY16 levels about the same, maybe to buy some time until after the election. Um, or we, you know, we could be looking at getting it all done before election day. You really never know. I don't have a, a, a clear still ball to tell you what will happen. Um, but Emily and Cheryl will definitely speak to more about the, how the election plays a role in the process. <laughs> Um, so as I said, we do have this goal of, of regular order, and we'll, we will see what happens. And so in an appropriations bill, what can you do? Um, you can fund priorities. You can say we're going to spend this dollar amount at NIH, or you can defund. You can say we're not going to spend um, anything, or we're going to spend less. So that's at the discretion of the appropriations committee. Um, and an appropriations bill also comes with something called report language. Um, and so that is where Congress is telling the agency, um, you know, we really want you to focus on a certain program or we really want you to sp pay special attention to rare diseases or whatever um, that might be. So those are the two t main types of things that are happening in appropriations bills. Um, and when you hear about policy writers, that's basically when the appropriators are saying you can't use this funding to pay for a certain type of activity. So that's the main content of an appropriations bill. And when we think about NIH in particular, this is just an overview. Um, you may remember sequestration, um, and you'll see that accounts for a big cut in 2013 on this chart. Um, but the good news is Congress has really shown a bipartisan commitment to the National um, Institutes of Health, and so actually appropriated a 6.6% increase um, in FY16. So, um, NIH is actually at $32 billion this year, which is really exciting, and we're starting to build back what was lost due to sequestration and budget cuts over the last five to ten years. Um, and so, of course, advocates are hoping for more um, this year, but really building on this bipartisan commitment to research at the NIH, which is very exciting. So once that money gets to NIH, how is it? allocated. So Congress does set levels for all 27 institutes and centers at NIH. Um, and then within that, about 80 percent of NIH's overall budget goes to extramural research. So that's research that's happening at academic institutions, probably in every state in your backyard where you come from at your um, university of your state all across the country. Um, and then about 10 percent of the research is happening at NIH facilities, so here in Bethesda, if you've been to the main campus, or at other NIH facilities, and that's called intramural research. Um, and the peer review process is really what's driving where this money is going, so we're letting science dictate where the priorities um, in research is and where the grant applications are being funded. Um, and one concrete way of seeing the way sequestration has played a role in um, in the budget at NIH is looking at the grant success rate. So as researchers are saying, I have a great idea and I'm submitting to NIH, here's my grant, I'd like you to fund it. Um, at the high, before sequestration, NIH was funding about one in three grants um, as an average over all of the ICs. And it depends, if some, some grant success rates are better at different institutes and centers. Um, but overall, for, and it, for all NIH research right now, it's about an 18 percent success rate. So it is climbing back up. Um, slowly, but we haven't gotten back to where we were when we, you know, the dollars and the purchasing power that was lost due to austere budgets over the last few years. So that's just one example. And then when we look to the FDA side, 
Um, the main takeaway here is that this is what Congress is allocating for the FDA. This does not include user fees that are coming to the FDA from industry. That is outside of the appropriations process. So when we're advocating for appropriated dollars at NIH, we're just talking about their base budget, which is about $2.7 billion. And the FDA has a really large portfolio, so they're regulating about one in four consumer dollars, so that's everything from, from medicines to foods to cosmetics. Um, and when we're talking about medicines, drugs, devices, and biologics, um, there is a focus on safety and efficacy before they can be approved. Um, and as I said, user fees are targeted to help speed um, approval, and you'll hear more in a coming session about um, user fees and how those work. Um, but when we look at the whole FDA budget, about 40% of it is devoted to drugs, devices, and biologics. So you can see um, this section here is the FDA budget that we're talking about for the purposes of approving therapeutics and treatments. So that is sort of our overview. I don't know. If